In this, part two of our discussion of the importance of setting in MGSV, we turn to the Mediterranean island, Cyprus. What little we see of Cyprus in the Phantom Pain is extremely faithful to the real place, from its highway signs to its small shacks, British military bases, and huge swath of forests, rivers, and beaches. As we'll see with Afghanistan, Cyprus sits at a crossroads which gives the island a unique blend of cultural influences. In the opening of The Phantom Pain, Snake experiences several visions of a decidedly Judeo-Christian and Greco-Roman variety, from a giant whale like from the Book of Jonah, to a demonic beast of pure fire and fury like Satan or perhaps Mars, the Roman god of war, to a Pegasus-like flying horse, and even arguably massacres somewhat like the kind described in the Bible during the times of Moses in Egypt, and also even a kind of flood. All of these are strongly relevant for Cyprus itself as a key location in both Judeo-Christian and Greco-Roman cultural pastimes. Cyprus has many centuries of history we could delve into vis-a-vis -vis MGSV. We could talk about it during ancient Greece when it was associated with the goddess of love Aphrodite, or we could talk Cyprus during the Crusades, when it briefly served as a joint possession of the Byzantinian and Ottoman empires, before, following Saladin's takeover of Jerusalem, it became a safe haven and eventual kind of forward operating base for nomadic Christians. But instead of delving into any of these topics directly, I'll be focusing on Cyprus's relevance for the question of global governance and more specifically, how the Cold War morphed into the War on Terror. At the end of the 19th century, Cyprus had traded hands from the Turkish and Persian-dominated Ottoman Empire to that of the British. The Ottomans were widely derided at the time as the sick man of Europe, meaning their collapse was imminent as it was evident. Meanwhile, Tsarist Russia was rapidly gaining power and fighting wars, Fears of Russian expansion led to the creation of the nation Afghanistan, for one, as a protective buffer separating Russia from the British colonial crown jewel, India. In 1878, this fear led to the Ottomans ceding authority over Cyprus to the UK. A few years before that, back in 1862, Britain had allowed the Ionian Islands it had gained in the Napoleonic Wars to reunify with their ancestral homeland, Greece. The Greek Cypriots anticipated a similar fate for Cyprus, which is what they wanted. But the more that these nationalists clamored for union or enosis, the more it catalyzed a Turkish equivalent, which by the late 50s would go on to become Taksim, or division. The Greek Cypriots wanted reunification, while the Turkish Cypriots wanted partition. When the Ottoman Empire collapsed after World War I, the Turkish Cypriots were given by the UK a choice to immigrate to Turkey or become citizens of the British Empire. This took place just before a short-lived Greek and Turkish War, which resulted with the forming of the Republic of Turkey. This new Turkish nation-state was compelled to renounce claims on former Ottoman regions, and that included Cyprus. However, this new Turkey was defined by massive socio-political and cultural reform, a kind that caught on by virtue of the shared language spoken by Turks in Cyprus. This so-called Kemalism ideology caused a new Turkish identity to emerge in the early 20th century, which actually overrode Islam in terms of how these Turkish-speaking Cypriots would see themselves. During World War II, the Cyprus Regiment of British Forces were made up of both Greeks and Turks. And this admixture of Greek and Turkish Cypriots was the kind of society that the British envisioned for the island, which set them at odds against the burgeoning nationalist 
respective movements there. Though the Cyprus Regiment of British forces would be deployed in many fronts in the war, from Europe to North Africa to the Middle East, Cyprus itself evaded Nazi attack thanks to a key disinformation campaign, one that would serve as an overture to the prologue of what we now know as D-Day, the invasion of Normandy. This ruse kept Cyprus safe by deploying fake tanks and faker news, allowing false intelligence to fall into the hands of Nazi spies about a completely phantom unit, the 7th Division. The Germans believed a force of 30,000 troops awaited them on Cyprus, and so the island was spared. Cyprus, especially in the wake of the Suez Canal incident, was too strategically crucial for the United Kingdom to let go on its own. After World War II, Greece and Turkey themselves both became merely pawns in the new paradigm called the Cold War. Turkey saw the Soviet Union begin to move into position for what appeared to be a potential coming invasion, while Greece, with its power vacuum that had been opened in the wake of Nazi occupation, descended into a civil war between monarchical and communist forces. It was then that, in the words at the time of the New York Times, a new kind of war was born. Although aspects of this new war could be traced back to the Boer War in South Africa, the Greek Civil War marked the true point of departure for the course warfare would take during the peace fought between soldiers and guerrillas, the Greek Civil War was, to quote A New Kind of War by Howard Jones, a quote, war in the shadows where enemies were difficult to define or even see. Victory wasn't, quote, measurable in territorial terms or human and material loss. The enemy rarely wore uniforms, fought with confiscated weapons, and used non-conventional warfare and terrorist tactics, abducting villagers and recruiting townspeople into their small but effective force. Like later wars would be in Indochina, Latin America, and the Middle East, these guerrillas were also called rebels, insurgents, or bandits. They could win simply by avoiding defeat, and since full-scale involvement, given they were believed to be assisted by the Soviets, could trigger for the United States World War III, the U.S. instead had to rely on a puppet regime in Greece as its proxy, notorious as it was for repression and brutality. As the New York Times then wrote, Greece presented, quote, a preview of the frontless, almost faceless war of tomorrow. A war of Trojan horses, pointing the way for machine guns where the battle line is drawn everywhere and nowhere, end quote. If the communists in Greece should prevail and the Turks got taken over by the forces of Joseph Stalin, the U.S. administration under Harry S. Truman feared the Soviets would be well on their way to taking over the entire Middle East. The bad faith and suspicion that defined the U.S.'s opinion of communism made the idea of an organic communist revolution difficult for any American to really accept. Even though the communists in Greece weren't following orders from the Kremlin, any idiot could see which of the two, East or West, whose orbit Greece would fall into should the uprising succeed. The administration was told by a Senator Vandenberg, quote, Mr. President, the only way you're ever going to get the U.S. to fund a proxy war in Greece is to make a speech and scare the hell out of the country. The very existence of the Greek state is today threatened by the terrorist activities of several thousand armed men led by communists. I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. The speech that Truman would give to this effect would refer to terrorist activities of several thousand armed men and present the defense of the monarchy in Greece as the defense of democracy against the unfreedom of communism. Truman's so-called Truman Doctrine, which was the announcement of a new policy to be practiced by the U.S. of international involvement against communism anywhere where it should spring up, had really to do, perhaps, with oil. In 1944, Stalin and Churchill, in the secret so-called Percentages Agreement, had split up the world into mutually respected spheres of influence. 
crucial to Churchill, but also the US, was Stalin not obtaining a foothold in the Mediterranean. Not only would a communist Greece or Turkey threaten the waterways that formed the arteries of world trade, such as that of the Suez Canal, Turkey would provide an entry point for the Soviets into the Middle East and thereby risk handing the Soviets predominance over the new center of the world's oil. So the US used the Truman Doctrine to, according to the Pulitzer Prize winning book Legacy of Ashes, create the CIA as a revivified wartime clandestine outfit based on the so-called OSS, and funnel money for the purposes of communist-style fronts and underground resistance building. They would launder this black budget through charities and publicly approved initiatives like the famous one to help rebuild Europe, the Marshall Plan. It wasn't until after World War II that, for a time, Turkey and Greece were ostensibly on the same side. Entities like the UN and NATO brought into being a kind of joint Balkan Union to oppose the spread of communism. However, on Cyprus, Greek Cypriots, as I've mentioned, strongly favored enosis or unification with Greece. These tensions would ultimately lead to the end of the Balkan Pact altogether. Following the Greek Civil War, which would largely, as I've intimated, define the nature of conflict during the Cold War, a not communist but nationalist guerrilla force came into being on Cyprus called the EOKA. It was founded by a veteran of both world wars, Georgios Grievous. In World War II, he had waged anti-communist warfare in Greece under a group calling itself the same name ironically, for MGS, as that of the resistance force featured in the film The Great Escape, Organization X. Ironically, unlike in most other similar situations after the war, in Cyprus the right wing was actually opposed to colonial rule, in this case that of the British Empire. But what made EOKA's anti-British campaign important was its relevance, much like the aforementioned Greek Civil War to the early days of the United Nations. With the dawn of the era of the UN, theatrics now had their appropriate audience. This leveled the potential playing field given how reality now mattered much less than perception. If the British were made to appear to be oppressing the Cypriots, the guerrillas could win home rule, they believed, despite their inferior fighting force. This problem we might call public relations would greatly define the political landscape of the 20th century and, ironically, leave the formerly mighty British Empire in retreat. These nationalist movements typically did not include those in their scheme from different backgrounds who spoke different languages, say, like the Turkish Cypriots. Like the Nazis to some extent, nationalists were very arbitrary in how they interpreted identity. Despite the fact that the Turkish speakers and the Greek speakers inhabited a single island called Cyprus, and despite the fact both spoke dialects that were different from their respective mainland analogues, the Greeks wanted to be part of Greater Greece, and the Turks saw themselves just as much a part of Greater Turkey. Intriguingly, Cyprus has been historically that rare case of a Christian theocracy, but also rare is the persistence on Cyprus of a Greek Orthodox or Byzantinian style of Christianity, going all the way back to not Zero, but Emperor Zeno. At the time of the rise of the EOKA, the political leader in Cyprus was Archbishop Makarios III. In retaliation for his 1955 petition to the UN for freedom and self-determination contrary to the doctrine of British rule, the British renditioned Makarios Gitmo style to the Seychelles in 1956. He would not be allowed to return until 59, where he was promptly elected president. But the conflict that would eventually explode into civil war in Cyprus would begin to arise almost right away with Makarios's return from Athens. The crusade of fighting communism got the US into bed with right-wing militants in Greece, who took power in a coup in 1967. When the junta took power in Greece, it would be with them that Makarios would then have to contend. At this point, Makarios wanted independence for Cyprus, and not necessarily a reunification with Greece. In addition, Makarios faced some problems internally within the Church of Cyprus. EOKA had split into a phantom called EOKAB, 
which agitated against Makarios with guerrilla warfare, much like the kind that had been fought in Greece. Ironically, this would soon result in a coup against him. When the new junta in Greece poured money into the election campaign of Richard Nixon, the establishment came to believe they were one of many small-scale, strongmen-led powers and unofficial allies of the United States that the CIA could understand and control. Much to the CIA's surprise, in 1974, the Greek nationalists tried to take Cyprus, which prompted the subsequent invasion of a fellow American-armed and trained member of NATO, Turkey. None other than the British would have to rescue Makarios from Greek-backed guerrillas. As Henry Kissinger would admit the day after President Nixon's resignation, quote, the CIA had been lying about its involvement in Greece, and those lies had started a war in which thousands died, end quote. In retaliation, a U.S. ambassador and CIA station chief would be killed in Greece. This was a prime example of what the CIA calls blowback, their word for consequences brought about by covert activities. And it all went back to the origins of the CIA and the Truman Doctrine, specifically to a phrase that was first uttered by America's first head of central intelligence, and in the words of Legacy of Ashes, words that would, quote, be eerily repeated by President George W. Bush after 9-11. The oceans have shrunk until today both Europe and Asia border the U.S. almost as do Canada and Mexico, end quote. Demetrios Ioannidis had been the boss of the repressive Greek secret police. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the conflict that brought Greece and Turkey to war over Cyprus as their battlefield had yet again to do with oil. Ioannidis, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, tried to overthrow Makarios III as part of a wider dispute with Turkey over oil rights in the Aegean Sea. Strangely, as I mentioned, both Greece and Turkey are members of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Though NATO was founded to ostensibly safeguard democracy in Europe, against communism, Greece has vacillated over the years between monarchy, republic, and junta-based governments, while Turkey even now remains thoroughly autocratic. And it goes without saying, neither Mediterranean nation are in the North Atlantic. Of course, the Soviets were anti-democratic as well. Both East and West saw democracy as merely an instrument, a means to an end. If needed, neither was above using different means, say, supporting a junta in Greece or violently suppressing an uprising in Czechoslovakia, if democratic ideals, or even the doctrines of, say, world communist revolution, got in the way of power and peace. Even the Truman Doctrine was as much about affecting the Soviet will than implementing any actual policy. It was to be a war over mines instead of territories or soldiers, and it all went back to the new existence of nuclear weapons. NATO, which couldn't depend on its members funding and arming a force of equivalent strength and size as Moscow's equivalent Warsaw Pact, heavily relied for its psychological deterrent on, of course, nuclear weapons. Just the idea that the Soviets could expect decimation should they try to take over Europe in the immediate post-war era was supposed to be enough to deter aggression. Instead, the Soviets, too, soon gained nuclear weapons, equalizing the playing field, and suddenly a new psychological force evolved known as mutually assured destruction. It was the people of the world this new doctrine took hostage without dropping a single post-war nuke. As American policymaker and co-architect of the Cold War, George F. Kennan said in 1947, the shadows rather than the substance of things moved the hearts and swayed the deeds of statesmen. End quote. The thing about Cyprus is that even though it's split between those who consider themselves Greek and those who consider themselves Turks, genetically, the two are much more similar to each other than any outside group. That's by virtue of geographic isolation. Furthermore, though the Greeks are typically thought of as a white people in the so-called West, and Turks as perhaps brown or Middle Eastern, in reality, Turkey, geographically, is as much part of Europe as Greece's influence can be found in the Middle East. The definitions in the face of geography, history, and science come from outside interests, namely Greek and Turkish nationalists, who would rather see Cyprus split in two than acknowledge it for what it really is, a minority group of diverse people 
no matter where, east or west, it's positioned in people's minds. Giving Cyprus the status of an independent nation-state would not only go against the best interests of outsiders like the Greeks, Turks, Soviets, and Americans, but more importantly, not unlike the questionable status of, say, D-Dog in MGSV, who no one can agree whether he's a dog, a wolf, or some sort of hybrid in between, making the polygot and diverse Cyprus into a nation ironically would conflict with the foundational premises of nationalism itself, which traditionally asserts one nation goes only with one people and one culture. On its own, Cyprus violates the legitimacy of both nationalism and racialism. Not even Greek or Turkish Cypriots amongst themselves can agree on whether they are white or black. After 9-11, religion became something of a shorthand for race, but not even all Muslims practice Islam the same. As I said, Turkey is mostly secular, despite being also Islamic. There were many such moderate, even secular Muslim nations prior to the War on Terror, and the atmosphere of polarization and orthodox thinking that it ushered in. Perhaps it is because Cyprus does not fit the times, given those times have been largely defined by a resurgence after the Cold War in nationalism, and yes, racialism, that it remains paralyzed and split in two to this very day. As Big Boss says, in the end the times define the politics. When you've grabbed their tail, they turn and bite your hand. Metal Gear Solid V is, in a word, about globalization. It's about how the international system has failed to prevent conflicts, and to the contrary, has perhaps actually fostered them, and Cyprus is a crucial case in point. Cyprus had been the possession of one empire after another, as we've covered, going all the way back to the era of ancient Greece. Its location in the corner pocket of the eastern Mediterranean has made it strategically valuable for eons. But with the fall of pre-20th century imperialism, demarcated by the independence of India and the Suez Canal incident in the 1950s, as well as the rise of doctrines like self-determination and popular rule, the old ways of great power geopolitics were supposed to be coming to an end. This underlined, in a way, the whole point of the United Nations, or so it seemed, as a kind of global democratic forum. Yet, some nations, to paraphrase Orwell's Animal Farm, were more equal than others. The UN Security Council gave five states permanent status, China, France, Russia, the UK, and the US. And throughout the Cold War's height, the UN remained largely powerless, at least militarily. The conflict between the British Empire on the one hand, and nationalist movements within its colonies, crown jewels, and protectorates on the other, as instantiated in the Suez and, yes, the Cyprus examples, was at the center of the reasoning behind creating first the League of Nations and then the UN. According to Mark Mazower, the British actually supported world governance as an imperial means of welding together their own power with America's, as well as safeguarding the resulting Anglo-American authority and supremacy. And that brings us again to Cyprus, the mythical birthplace, as I said, of Aphrodite. Cyprus is an important place historically, not only for Christianity, but for the Greek paganism that preceded it. Cyprus may have been the origin for the myth and cult of Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, also known under the Roman name Venus. Aphrodite came from a pre-Christian world before nudity symbolized sin, which has a lot of relevance for the nearly naked character Quiet. The way Quiet loves and relishes bathing resembles how worshippers of Aphrodite partook in bathing rituals and closely associated Aphrodite with water. This actually speaks to the importance for MGSV of the concepts of moral exceptionalism and civilization. The globalized world we inhabit today draws much of its character, beliefs, and features from the traditions bestowed by ancient Greece, or at least how those inheritances were interpreted by the British Empire in the late 19th century. 
The idea that Greece became civilized by a natural, ideology-free process of enlightenment, which involved scientific progress, the discovery of democracy, and Christianization, would arguably play a key role in the idea of the white man's burden, a phrase that's shorthand for the white so-called race's obligation to educate and civilize the savages and the immature non-white races of the non-European world. And this in turn would be a very subtle yet nonetheless very fundamental topic of focus for the Phantom Pain. You might even say the game is positing the idea that English linguistic imperialism predicated on a Judeo-Christian morality is the phantom left in the wake of Greco-Roman paganism, and Cyprus is right at the nexus of all of these. That's right, the same war that got the US into Cuba that we looked at last time was the context for Kipling's infamous phrase, the white man's burden. He also coined another crucial phrase for MGSV, describing the Cold War-esque conflict between Russia and the UK during the 19th century over Afghanistan as the Great Game. In many respects, in the eons since Kipling first devised that saying, it has never been game over. But that's for another video. To understand this idea that the League and later the UN were arguably created in the name of making the white English-speaking world's dominance permanent, we'll have to discuss when we get to South Africa, the politician Jan Smuts, who despite disbelieving in actual voting rights and equality for black South Africans, also advocated strenuously for human rights. And at the time, no one seemed to notice the inherent contradiction. That's because, in essence, the white man's burden, at least on paper, was a way of doing to non-white groups more or less what Christianity did to paganism. To the Christian, what they've done to paganism is an improvement, a necessary improvement to initiate the pagan into modern civilization. That is to say, the only way to heaven was through tutelage by the big brother-like priests, Ironically, the base administrative center for British overseas territory in Cyprus, Akrotiri and Dekelia, which was retained by the UK following the Cyprus incident to keep the peace in what quickly became a permanent state of emergency, it's located in the same area that, according to the CIA factbook, quote, previously served as the bishop's seat of a Christian Orthodox diocese, end quote. Anyway, keeping Cyprus divided has made it one of the international system's most important tax havens. Al-Qaeda used Cyprus to fund their operations discreetly. That is, prior to the passing of the U.S. Patriot Act. Ironically, one of the U.S. officials who was asked to step in and mediate the Turkey-Cyprus dispute was future two-time Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. In case it wasn't obvious, this new type of warfare that we've been describing that began in Greece and spread to Cyprus that originated during the Cold War would become in the 21st century characteristic also of the War on Terror. Mutual hatred over what each side of the Cypriot conflict had lost split the former northern and southern regions into two completely different miniature client states, both of which ostensibly belong to either Greece or Turkey's sphere of influence. And in between them, in tandem with the UN's so-called Green Line, there are the British, as I mentioned, who never lost control. English, it so happens, is widely spoken by both communities as their only lingua franca. The dispute between Turkish and Greek Cypriots over Cyprus speaks to the logic of nationalism and the conflict between minority rights and national sovereignty in the era of global governance, codified by the UN. Back in 1923, precursor to the UN, the League of Nations, had authorized a mandatory population transfer between Turkey and Greece. The League of Nations, to some extent, believed that the rights of minorities had to be protected by international law. But after World War II, this approach of moving minorities to where they so-called properly belonged completely replaced the initial idea that minority rights were in need of protecting. Nationalism is a kind of purity that puts the nationalist into direct confrontation with minorities within their borders. 
Ever since World War II, it's been taken as a given that the UN has no right to tell a country what it does to its own people, only to govern international relations. This puts minorities, even linguistic minorities, in danger. Ethnic diversity, after World War II, was now assumed to be a major source of conflict in of itself. In fact, the logic behind enosis of a pan-Greek revival would, like other similar movements, such as pan-Africanism, pan-Asianism, and pan-Arabism, collapse under the paradigm of the nation-state. Arguably, this emphasis on national identities as synonymous with ethnic identity and purity would lead to outbreaks of intermittent genocide for years to come. The flaw within the UN system is self-defense is impossible without a nation of your own, and gradually that became without a nuke of your own. This is why, say, black people and natives in America, or Arabs and Palestinians in Israel, or for that matter Muslims in India, were able to all be oppressed in their own way without the UN being able to address these issues, and also why civil wars soon became the norm especially in the post-Cold War age. Conflicts within national borders were considered the sole business of the given nation's supposedly sole majority ethnic group. We see the same dynamic as Cyprus play out in the Merck outfit CFA, who are pulled apart by diverging loyalties that split along nationalist lines. And the same we'll see also happens to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, who, following the Soviet withdrawal, quickly turn on each other relative to tribal and ethnic affiliations. Ultimately, MGSV seems to suggest true peace and power belong to those who set in place the world's ideas, its language of languages, as it were, its lingua franca. For Skullface, this lingua franca wouldn't be of peace, but revenge. Like the UN depends on nationalism, Skullface would depend on the doctrine of revanchism, derived from the French word for revenge. It's defined by Merriam-Webster as, quote, of or relating to a policy designed to recover lost territory or status, end quote. And it's something we'll discuss more comprehensively when next time we head to Afghanistan. Until next time, boss.